Today's lecture will be on Chapter 11, Human Resource Management. So what is human resource management? Last, it's the process, ongoing process, of determining human resources needs. And then once you determine those needs, to then recruit, select, develop, motivate, evaluate, compensate, and schedule those employees to meet the overall goals of the organization. So <clears throat> the role of human resources management has grown in the last several years because of two main things. One, increased recognition of employees as a valuable resource. And two, changes in human resource law that have rewrote old workplace practices. Let's look at the first role here. So increased recognition of employees as a resource. And humans are still the ultimate resource because humans still do, at least to this point, what, what machines can't do, although that's changing and we've talked about that. So in certain industries, such as high-tech service or high-tech manufacturing, requires employees to have very highly technical job skill sets. And these workers are scarce, and it's important to find these. So what I want you to take out of this is that humans still are a huge resource for organizations. So what are challenges then to find these ultimate resources? It's just as I said, there's a shortage of trained workers in key areas. And you can see going down this list, there's a lot of challenges that a human resource manager will have to try to find the right human to make sure that they are in place to meet the organization's, organization's needs. Now remember, the, the second role was changing laws. So let's talk about some of the laws that we have with regards to human resource management. Probably the most important law with regards to human resource management occurred 50 years ago, and that was the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Specifically, Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act prohibits discrimination in <coughs> hiring, firing, compensation, and you can see other things based on certain criteria. Those criteria include race, religion, creed, sex, age, national origin. One thing to keep in mind that Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act only applies for companies with 15 or more employees. So a company with five employees does not have to follow Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So eight years later, in 1972, Congress passed the Equal Employment Opportunity Act, or the EEOA. And this, in essence, strengthened the already existing Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which was came out of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So it provided further guidelines on the 1964 Act. Some of the things that came out of the EEOC have been very controversial, which we'll talk about on the next slide. So the Equal Employment, Employment Opportunity Commission passed certain things that have been deemed controversial. One is the notion of affirmative action. And affirmative action is a policy designed to, quote, right past wrongs, unquote, by increasing opportunities for women and minorities. An offshoot of affirmative action is the notion of reverse discrimination. And this is now discrimination against members of a majority or dominant group, such as whites or males, usually as a result of policies designed to correct previous discrimination, such as affirmative action. The Civil Rights Act was again modified in 1991. <coughs> Here, 
So as you can see, it amended Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. But the major difference here is it gave victims of discrimination now the right to, one, a jury trial where they did not have a jury trial before and possible punitive damages. Punitive damages are damages to impose punishment upon the employer for violating the act. Another law that is of prominent importance is the Americans with Disabilities Act. This was passed in 1990. Under the Americans with Disabilities Act, it requires employers to give applicants who either have physical or mental disabilities the same consideration for employment as people who do not have such disabilities. In essence, it, allow, it, it mandates employers to provide quote unquote reasonable accommodations. Another law that was passed was the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. So this was protects workers who are age 40 and over from employment and workplace discrimination. This applies to employers with 20 or more employees. So as you can see, talking about a lot of the laws, the law is constantly evolving. And so a human resource manager, one of their primary obligations is to stay current on laws and that are that have been passed or may be passed in the future. So you can see changes in the law and registration and legislation occur regularly and you got to stay on top of that. So what is the human resource planning process? And as you can see, there's a list of five things here. So on the next slide, we're gonna talk about what a job analysis is. And then for the remainder of today's lecture, we're gonna establish a strategic plan, which is in step five. Let's talk about a job analysis first. Job analysis simply is a study of what employees do who hold various job titles. The result of a job analysis is two things. One, a job description, and two, job specifications. A job description is simply a summary of the objectives of the job, the type of work and responsibilities, duties, as well as working conditions and relationships to other jobs. Think of the job description as a description simply about the job whereas job specifications simply is a summary of the minimum qualifications that are needed to do a particular job. So who can and who cannot do the job? So if the job calls for a law degree, only people who have a law degree meet the specifications to do the job, even though someone with a, who doesn't have a law degree may be able to do the job description, they gotta have the proper specifications. So for the next remaining part of today's lecture, we're gonna talk about a strategic plan. Remember that was step five. The first thing we're gonna look at is recruitment. Recruitment is simply the set of activities for obtaining the right number of qualified people at the right time. Recruitment can be very, very expensive. You gotta find the right people. How do you find the right people? Well, you can look at both internal sources as well as external sources to recruit employees. Internal sources can include such things as people such as transfers within the company, promoting someone up within the company. Um, you retrain current employees to do something different etc. External sources or sources outside of the organization, as you can see here on the left part of the slide, can be from, you know, colleges or a myriad of different locations. So that's recruiting. The next step in the strategic plan is selection. So after you've recruited, you must select. Selection is the process of simply gathering information 
in deciding who should be hired to serve the best interests of both the individual employee as well as the company. What are the steps in the selection process? I'm not gonna go through all of them here, but you can see you gotta complete an application form, conduct initial as well as follow-up interviews, possibly give a test, maybe conduct a background investigation. You may need to conduct a physical exam. And then once you select, establish work periods, uh, which is like a trial period or probationary period. So remember the first step in the selection process was to complete an application. So here's where job applicants oftentimes make mistakes. Oftentimes, employers don't want to hire people on a full-time basis, but rather would hire what's known as contingent workers. <coughs> contingent workers include part-time workers, temporary workers, seasonal workers, independent contractors, people who are not paid, known as interns, and student co-ops. Most contingent workers are young, usually under the age of 25. So why are businesses hiring more and more contingent workers? Well, such as during periods of peak demand, such as the holidays, but more often in uncertain economic times, but really the main reason is the fourth, is the fourth reason that you can see on the slide is to save on employee benefits because oftentimes contingent workers are not eligible for such things as benefits, whether it's health insurance or vacation days, et cetera. The next step in the overall process is to train and develop employees. Oftentimes, training and development is the same thing, but there's a big difference. Training focuses on short-term skills to increase an employee's ability to perform, whereas development focuses on long-term abilities. So think of training as doing the day-to-day -day work, but de development focuses on the abilities to move up within the organization. So what are common training and development activities? Well, orientation is one. That's when you first join the company before you actually start work. You find out a little bit about the company. Oftentimes, then you have on-the-job training right there on the field. So you can have on-the-job, you can have off-the-job training, such as at a classroom. Sometimes it can be virtual, online. Or, you know, you can actually do a simulation before getting out there. So think, think about an airline pilot who goes through a cockpit simulation before actually flying a plane. Remember, you train in the short term and you develop in the long term. So management development is the process of training good employees to become eventually good managers and then to monitor the progress of their skills over time. So you're developing developing these employees to move up within the organization. And training development for managers includes such things as coaching, job rotation, and again, training off the job as well. Other things that development can include is the notion of networking and mentors. Networking is the process of establishing and maintaining contacts with key people, both in the organization and outside of the organization. So he always wanted, it's, sometimes it's not so much um, the job, but who you know in order to move up in the organization. That's someone who does a good job of networking. Mentors are people usually within the organization who supervise, coach, and guide selected lower level employees to develop them so that they will eventually become good managers.
next step in the overall human resource management process is the notion of job performance or appraisals. And a performance appraisal simply is a valuation that measures employee performance against established standards in order to make decisions about very important things, promotions, compensation, further training, or possibly even termination. Usually performance appraisals are done by someone's immediate supervisor or someone else, someone else higher in the organization. However, a new approach that is gaining popularity is known as a 360 degree review performance appraisal. This gives managers opinions from people at a variety of levels within the organization. The idea is to get a more accurate idea of the worker's ability. So people above, coworkers, people beneath are all giving performance appraisals of that employee. <clears throat> Let's look at the steps of performance appraisals. The first one is very important, is to establish performance standards. So the idea is standards. So when you, if there's eight employees who are in the same position within the organization, when each of those eight employees are up for an appraisal, performance appraisal, they all go against the same standards. Those standards need to be measurable, quantifiable, understandable, and reasonable. Once you establish those standards, those standards have to be clearly communicated. The third step is to make sure that you evaluate the actual performance of the employee against the standards that you established in step one. Once you've evaluated and you've gathered the data, then it's important to discuss the results of the performance appraisal with the employee. If action is needed, you need to take corrective action and not put that off and then using the results to make important decisions. This can be a very stressful process, so there are certain things that you should do and certain things you shouldn't do during a performance appraisal. First, let's look at the do's. Make sure you allow sufficient time that is free from distractions for the appraisal. Make sure you employee, include the employee in the process as much as you can. And even if the performance appraisal comes out bad, make sure you always end the appraisal with positive suggestions for employee improvement. There are things you should not do during a performance appraisal. Never attack the employee personally. It's never personal. Don't make the employee feel uncomfortable or uneasy. And probably most importantly, don't wait. If something is wrong, let's take corrective action now. So the results of performance appraisals can maybe be if someone's lacking in training to identify some training or development that needs to be done. If a good performance appraisal has been done to use it as a tool for maybe promotion or to recognize workers' achievements. However, if it's a bad performance appraisal, that performance appraisal could be used in part as a basis for possible separation or termination from the job. Three things, three mistakes that often happen during performance appraisals. The first is what's known as the contrast effect, and that's we compare one employee to another. Never do it. Remember, it's against, it's, you do it against established standards. That was the first step. Number two is known as the halo horn effect. You should not allow performances in specific areas to unfairly influence the overall performance evaluation. So if someone does bad in one area but does great in another six areas, you shouldn't let that one bad thing overall have more effect over the six good things. Finally, the similar to me effect, and that's where you give generosity to those you feel are more like you, look like you, and get along with. Let's move to the next step of human resources management, which is known as compensation. And most people work primarily because they want to be compensated. You can see there's a lot of reasons 
why good compensation can be good for the organization as well as obviously for the employee. The major type of compensation is pay, but there are other types of comp compensation here that we'll talk about in the next several slides. So let's talk about pay first on the next three slides. The first type of pay is known as a salary, and that's where you make a set amount of money, whether it's an annual salary, a weekly salary, et cetera. The main thing you should know is that salaried employees do not receive additional pay for any additional hours that they work. Second is known as an hourly wage or possibly work for a day. And your wage here is based on you know, the number of hours you work or how many days you work. It's not a salary. Third method of pay is known as a piecework system. Here, wage is based on the number of items produced rather than the number of hours you work for today. So if you make, if you're very productive and you make 20 widgets in an hour, you get paid on the 20 widgets and not per hour. Fourth type of pay system is known as commission. And that's pay based on a percentage of sales that you make. So for instance, the more cars you sell, the higher the commission you make. <coughs> the next several have to do with bonuses. And a bonus plan simply is extra pay, usually for accomplishing or surpassing certain goals or objectives. Most, goal, most bonuses are either monetary or non-monetary. Non-monetary bonuses will include such things as thank you notes, appreciation notes, maybe other types of things that have value, monetary value, but it's not necessarily money, such as movie tickets or gift cards, etc. Profit sharing plans is a type of bonus or extra pay, but it's based, based on the company's profit. So to the extent that the organization turns a profit for the year, the employee will get a certain amount of the profits. Thus, if the company does not make a profit that year, there will be no profit sharing bonus. The seventh one I want to look at is another type of bonus known as gain sharing. Here's a bonus that's paid, but it's based on achieving certain metrics, such as maybe more higher quality control measures or customer satisfaction measures or producing more over the course of the year. Everyone gains in the share they beat, since you beat certain goals. Final type of pay I want to talk about is known as stock options. This is only for corporations because only corporations issue stock. And it allows its employees of a company that has stock to purchase the stock at a specific price over a specific time period. It's optional. So up till now, we've looked at individual compensation or pay. Now we're looking more over since team works or teams are becoming more um, prevalent in organizations to compensate not individually, but rather on how the team performs. So the two most common methods of team compensation is skill-based pay or gain sharing. Next several slides, I want to talk about fringe benefits. So this is a different type of compensation besides your ordinary pay. So fringe benefits include such things as vacation pay, sick leave, pension plans, or health plans. These provide additional compensation beyond their normal salary or wages. What's really important to note is how much fringe benefits have gone up or as, a, as a percentage of employer costs. So 100 years ago, fringe benefits accounted for 2% of a payroll cost. Today, it's almost 30%. And as you could probably imagine, healthcare has been the biggest increase in fringe benefit costs. <coughs> so what are some of these fringe benefits here? Well, there's a wide range of fringe benefits. So you can see some of them are, you know, Healthcare related, such as dental or eye care, beyond that. But some of them, as you move higher up in the organization, the nicer the fringe benefits get, such as country club memberships, um, you know, daycare for elder 
for an elder care services, et cetera. So you can see there's a lot of fringe benefits out there. So certain companies use exotic types of fringe benefits to try to recruit and recruit the best employees. So DreamWorks, the motion picture studio, uses such fringe benefits as free DVD rentals, breakfast, lunch, you know, profit sharing, free snacks, et cetera, to try to get the best employees to work for them. Oftentimes fringe benefits are known as what's called cafeteria style benefits. And this allows employees to choose the benefits up that they want up to a certain dollar amount. So if you're given $5,000 of fringe benefits, you can select how you want to spend that $5,000. Other types are what's known as soft benefits, which means they can use them or not use them. You can see some of the soft benefits that are noted here on the slide. Now let's move into another aspect of human resources management, which is known as scheduling. And as you can see here with scheduling here, traditional scheduling was a traditional nine to five job that you went into your employer, did your work from nine till five, then you went home and you didn't do any work anymore. <clears throat> but as you know, because of technology and the role of families and, and people wanting to do lots of things, your traditional schedule doesn't necessarily work much anymore. So let's look at some alternative types of scheduling. The first one is known as a flex time plan. This gives employees freedom to choose which hours to work so long as they work the required number of hours. We'll talk a little bit more about flex time here in a moment. Another type of flexible scheduling plan is what's known as the compressed work week employees work the full number of work hours but in fewer than the standard number of days. So for instance, employees here at Northrop or Lockheed oftentimes work um, four 10-hour days. That way they get their 40 hours per week and then they get a Friday off. More and more people are taking two job sharing. This lets two or more part-time workers share the full-time job. So oftentimes you're seeing this in elementary school teachers where you have a two teachers share the same job. So most of these flex time plans re require what's called core time and I'll show you a visual representation of this in a moment. Core time simply is when all the employees are expected to be at their job stations. So for an example of flex time that shows core time, let's look at Sarah. So at this company, you can work between 6.30 in the morning and 6.30 in the evening. That's 12 hours. So you can see here that Sarah wants to get in early, maybe to avoid traffic. So she starts at 7 and she has to, she's there till 11. She has to be there between 9.30 and 11. That's the core time. You're allowed up to three hours to take your lunch. Sarah just takes half an hour lunch and she's done. She goes back to work at 1130. She works till 330. She's also there for the second core time between two o'clock and three o'clock. So she starts early and gets out early. So she's working her required amount of hours and she's there during her core time, but her job allows her to be flexible in the hours that she works. So as we mentioned, one of them was compressed work weeks. Um, oftentimes these are very popular with employees because they enjoy longer weekends. So if they work long days, it's nicer to have a three-day weekend. You can do more traveling, et cetera. And you can see certain industries, this has become standardized, such as nurses and firefighters. Before the coronavirus hit, you could see that many Americans work from home at least several days a month. Now everyone seems to be working from home if you still have a job. So the idea of home-based work is another way to schedule employees to make a, meet a work-life balance. 
And I would imagine because of such technologies such as Zoom, the idea of home-based work will continue to grow in popularity. Because a lot of you guys are trapped at home right now, you can see there are advantages and disadvantages of being trapped at home. And this holds true for home-based work. So you can see, you can look at this from the viewpoint of the company, of the individual, and just of society. So at your convenience, please look at both the benefits and challenges of home-based work to those three stakeholders. Another thing we talked about with scheduling was job sharing. And this provides employment opportunities for many people who just cannot work full time. Many, for instance, parents, newborn parents, want to be able to have time at home with their newborns or their kids, and so they don't want to work full time. So job sharing allows them to still get out in the workforce, but not have to commit full time to it. And what we found out that workers who job share, they tend to be much more happier, enthusiastic, and even more productive. Finally, the last aspect of human resource management is the idea of employees moving on for a myriad of reasons. So some of them are good, such as employees are moving on because they're either promoted or they're reassigned somewhere else, and that's a good thing. However, oftentimes, employees move on because they either retire or because they're forced out, they're terminated, which means they are no, they're separated from the organization, and this can be due for such things as performance reasons, bad performance appraisals, or for no reason of their own because we had economic situations dictate. We head into a recession or a depression where there's just not enough money to pay the employee. So if you ever have to terminate an employee, it's never fun. But what I would always say is making sure that when you terminate an employee, you document everything. So if you have a performance appraisal, it's fully documented and that you follow the, all those aspects of the performance review. And because what you see now today is a lot of lawsuits based on terminations. And so if you have to terminate someone, which is never a fun thing to do, you make sure you follow the correct procedures in doing so. This concludes our lecture on Chapter 11 human resources management.